All right, Alexander, let's answer the uh, the questions that we had from our viewers from mm. our live stream yesterday with uh, Robert Barnes, a fantastic mm. live stream. And of course, we oh, would like to thank right. Robert for uh, joining us on that live stream. And uh, we have a lot of questions from YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, and of course, mm. Locals, the Duran.locals.com. That is the best place to find us in case uh, of who knows what. But uh, <laughs> whatever happens, you could always find us on the Duran.locals.com. And let's just uh, jump right into it, Alexander, with the questions. We have a lot of great, great questions from uh, viewers. This one comes from Raphael, who says, We all must admit, if Merkel and May were still around, there is no they, no way they will let Biden get Europe involved in this mess. Merkel would say no. I would have agreed with that. I actually do agree with that. I, mean, I didn't like Matt. I did not like Angela Merkel. I don't take back anything I said about her. I think her effect on German politics and on European politics was disastrous. But she was she did have the skill of seeing the bumps ahead in the road. And she would certainly not have allowed situation to get so completely out of control as it did um, over the last couple of months. And what basically happened, I, I am absolutely convinced of this, is that we got a very weak very inexperienced German government led by a very weak chancellor and some very inexperienced and reckless young green ministers, very disconnected from reality. And the result was that that gave the opening for the neocons in the United States and the hardliners in all sorts of other places to basically set the narrative and lead us to this point of destruction and in fact, you can start to see that it seems to me that already you can start to see that in Germany, people are starting to have second thoughts. You can see that they've resisted moves to de-swift more Russian banks. You can see that they've resisted more moves to restrict oil and gas imports from Russia. They've also resisted moves to fast track Ukraine into, uh, into the EU. But it's too late the train has now left the station, and um, um, the point was the, the time to have stopped all those things, the time to have worried about all of those things, was before the war began. So I agree. I think Raphael's got it exactly right. Yeah. Well, Deutsche Bank has reversed uh, positions, though. They said they were not going to pull out of Russia. Now they've announced that they will. I know, exactly. So that's yeah. an interesting development. Yeah, absolutely. Well, of course. Yeah. It's Deutsche Bank. Yeah. Yeah. No. All right. Raphael also says, uh, remember who said first Turkey is where the solution is. A Russian soldier let the truth out. He said USA is who we are going after. They are lost. <laughs> well, I, I hope we don't get a whole uh, 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 that doesn't lead to a global uh, a military conflict. But ultimately, I agree with this. I mean, obviously, there's Ukraine versus Russia, but ultimately it's. Russia versus America, just as it was during the Cold War, with, of course, the important difference, the important point that, you know, we're not talking about everybody in the US. We're not talking about every single person there. As Robert Barnes explained during our live stream, the political elite that makes these decisions in the US is extremely small. And much of the, much of the um, you know, the American electorate, much of the population are very distanced from them and in many cases don't like them. Yeah. Bon Bon says, do you think that Yeltsin, Putin or the FSB bear any responsibility for the September 99 Russian apartment bombings that helped to popularize Putin? I went into this in enormous detail back in the time and... Uh, thereafter. I think that Putin himself had no role in it. I mean, he'd only just come in. I don't think he had in any, he would have been in any position to pull any levers. I don't think the FSB was involved. I don't think personally Yeltsin himself was involved either. That doesn't necessarily mean that some bad actors on the Russian side weren't involved. And I, you know, I, I, that, that was a particularly complex and difficult time in Russia. Very, all kinds of very sinister people were operating at that time. The Russian oligarch Boris Berezovsky was the head of Russia's Security Council, or I seem to remember he had some kind of a political role. The Chechens, 
uh, Churchian people, uh, people who were on the Churchian side at that time, were actually admitting that at the same time as he had that role in uh, the Russian hierarchy, he was actually bankrolling them at the same time. And he was telling them, you know, go and take hostages and I will pay the money to get the hostages released. And that's one way I will fund you. <laughs> he was doing those sort of things. Now, you know, when you're dealing with people like that, and, you know, Berezovsky was not the only one. When you're dealing with that kind of situation, can you definitely say that there was no Russian side to this? Well, of course you can't. I don't think Putin himself was involved. I don't think the FSB was involved. And I don't think Yeltsin was involved. But saying that doesn't mean that there was no Russian role in it at all. All right. Raul says uh, European Parliament calls on EU to block funds for rule of law violators. Poland and Hungary. Thoughts? Well, there <laughs> we I, go. I mean, you know, can I just say one thing? Yeah. I, I saw a meme. The other day, Alexander, real quick, I saw a meme with uh, with a Polish flag, uh, a Ukraine flag, a Russian flag, and uh, and the Germany EU. Right? It said uh, German. It said Russia is uh, is fighting Ukraine. Uh, Poland is taking uh, refugees from Ukraine and giving yeah. arms and weapons to Ukraine. And Germany is sanctioning Poland. <laughs> and I think it was Gonzalo Lira says, said, hey, everybody in Poland and Hungary, nice uh, relationship you have with uh, the European Union. You're getting sanctioned on the one end, but on the other end, you have to take in your involved yeah. in this entire mess. <laughs> it, yeah. was, it was I, 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 I mean, I can't really add to those comments. All I would say is, and, and this is the important thing to, to remember, when you are dealing with ideologues, which is what we're talk talking about where the EU is concerned, ideologues aren't really interested in nuances. They aren't interested in realities. They're not going to set aside, you know, what gets in their way, in, their, in the way of their beloved project, just because, you know, there's a war going on in Ukraine. So it's unsurprising. Now, I, the people who I really feel need to start thinking very hard about where they are are the Poles and the Hungarians, I mean, I think in Hungary they do. I think in Poland, in Hungary they do. They, 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 they are still, you know, this. I, I think Alex put it incredibly well. They, they allowing their historic feud with Russia, which has real historical foundation. I'm the first to admit that, but it's historic. They are allowing that historic feud with Russia to blind them, to cloud their judgment even though it's not Russia, as I said, that's doing anything to them at the moment. It's the EU. It's not Russia that's interfering in their internal politics. It's the EU that is. And they're sanctioning them. <laughs> and they're sanctioning them. It's crazy. Them, exactly. It is crazy, crazy, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's going to be, a, it's, going to, it's going to have an effect on Poland as well. I mean, it's going to, I mean, it's, it's going to have a real impact on the Polish economy at a time when, of course, the entire world is sliding into recession. <gasps> That's what I fear with, uh, I don't know if it'll hit Hungary, yeah. but I fear with, uh, with Poland, I fear. My, my, thoughts, is it, yeah. uh, my thoughts are that uh, the recession is going to create a lot of election turmoil throughout the, yeah. uh, the EU. And you're yeah. going to see, you know, say conservative governments fall to uh, left liberal governments, neoliberal yeah. governments. And you're going to see neoliberal left Governments lose to to conservative neocon governments, whatever. You're going to just see a, a whole spectrum shift. Yeah, I think in Poland, where it is a 50-50, yeah. the recession is going to do a lot of damage to the law and justice. And uh, Absolutely. what that would usher in would be a, a party that is much more friendlier to the European Union. Absolutely. That's I, I, I agree with you completely. But... Um, it's so obvious, I think, that, you know, the law and justice, the leadership of law and justice, Kaczynski, Duda, all those people, uh, uh, the Polish prime minister, I can't remember his name off, offhand. But, I mean, they are, they are so fixated with Russia <laughs> that they don't see this. And it astonishes me. But there we go. People are often like this. Their, um, their fixation with something blinds them to their own interests. But... I think that's exactly. I think I think you've explained it exactly right. Mm -hmm. uh, Tim, thank you for that super sticker, Valias. Thank you for that super chat. And Raphael says, "Guys, I'm a military man. What Russia is doing now, under these circumstances, by themselves, without losing their discipline, only Russia can." 
I agree with that, you know. That's from I Raphael. absolutely do. Uh, it's one of the things people just don't understand. You, going back to our discussion with Robert Barnes, I mean, the whole way of um, the, the whole American way of war is to minimize casualties. And that means, you know, you bomb and bomb and sh do all those sort of things. So be remember, before the 1999. Did you say mi minimize casualties? What minimize exactly. American casualties? That's the I, I should um, say. Okay, okay. Uh, minimize okay. American casualties. You remember the Amer the the we we we've, we've discussed the the two thousand three war when you know it took them three weeks to get to Baghdad, but and they did lots of bombing then, but at least in two thousand three they marched in simultaneously with the bombing in uh, nineteen ninety ninety one when of course. Iraq's army was in a better shape. They bombed Iraq for two months mm -hmm. and on a you know enormous scale. And they only started to advance at the point when the Iraqis themselves were retreating because ultimately causing uh, um, devastation, causing massive destruction was far more important. You know, it, it minimized casualties because the US can't, fight a war in which it takes casualties. Russia is different. They are much more, uh, they're much more willing to accept losses because their objective always is to fulfill their political objectives. I'm going to say something else. It's not just, of course, the military that's very di disciplined. It's the political leadership that's very disciplined. I've been reading all kinds of people who've been speculating that there's been splits within the political leadership over this issue. I haven't detected one. No one of importance has actually suggested that they're in disagreement with this strategy. Jay Kaiser, thank you for your super chat. And Pingu Community says, can you very quickly explain the situation in Syria? Mm. I haven't been following Syria as well or as closely as I should. I understand that the Russian military is still active in Syria. They haven't let up there at all. And I understand that the Syrian military have been steadily again increasing their control over more and more areas of Syria. And I also understand that the US is quietly pulling out of some parts of Syria, including their base at Al Tanf. They're gradually reducing the number of people they have there. And I also understand that there's fighting going on increasingly between the Kurds and the Turks in northeast Syria, though this isn't widely reported. So lots of things going on there. There's also been another attempt by ISIS, it seems, to revive in central Syria, and that has provoked much bombing. So I think that what we're looking at in Syria is a slow, halting stabilisation, but one in which there's still a great deal of war and where there is still intense economic hardship partly as a result of these very ferocious sanctions which have been imposed on the country. Now, before this conflict in Ukraine started, there was a lot of talk about Syria being readmitted into the Arab League. I haven't followed this, but it was supposed to happen this month. I don't know whether that Arab League summit is going to happen. I don't know whether that decision is going to be made, but maybe that's the thing to really look out for, because... It seems to me that if Syria is readmitted into the Arab League, then the war in Syria is over. And I say that because at that point, the Arab countries, the big Arab countries, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf monarchies, all of the rest, having readmitted Syria into the Arab League, would be committed to opposing the presence of foreign troops and I mean here American and Turkish troops, on Arab land. And that will mean that the political pressures for a total US and ultimately Turkish withdrawal will increase. But that, it seems to me, is the key event. It could very well be that this conflict in Ukraine has put it back. Yeah. Hell, War Hell Warden says uh, this podcast is the scroll of truth. Thank you very much for that. Thank you. RDDR says, how do we decide who is the imperialist here? Mm -hmm. How do we decide? Who, I'm going to give a pass to who is the imperialist here. <laughs> um, my own personal view 
is that the Russians believe that this was not a war of choice. It is a war that was forced on them. And I've seen, period, I've seen you know, uh, um, polling data coming out of Russia, which I trust, by the way, which says that. And that the Russians see Ukraine as an existential issue. I don't just mean the political elite, I mean the larger population. They see Ukraine as an existential issue. They see NATO extension, expansion as an existential issue. So I think that the Russians certainly, in their own self-perception, do not believe that they are imperialists. They see themselves as having gone into Ukraine in order to protect their own positions and to try to negotiate a resolution of this conflict which has been ongoing for eight years and in which people in the Donbass have been facing shelling. I, that, I think, is the Russian perception. And I don't think that they're out to recreate the Soviet Union, re-establish the Russian Empire, do all of those things. Again, I stress again, I don't think that is the Russian self-perception. I think on the other side, I avoid using words like imperialist. I refer to instead a globalist project. And I think that the peop there are people in Washington who very much remain committed to this globalist project and they see this war in Ukraine as being their last real opportunity to break one of the key obstacles to the achievement of that project, which is Russia. And they hope that if they can break Russia, they can encircle and break China too. And I think that that is their objective. As I said, imperialist is a word which I think really belongs to another time. But if you look at globalization as what they're seeking, then I think that there are people in Washington who do think in that way and who are pursuing that objective now. Yeah, I would also add in there that uh, outside of the globalist objective that they're yeah. looking to protect, I, th I think there is a small group of people, maybe not so small, to be honest, mm -hmm. both yeah. in Brussels and in D.C., that yeah. want to uh, protect all the dirt that that's, is in and around it. Ukraine. I say that with Absolutely. the whole biolab discovery and all that that's coming out. Of course, we have Absolutely. Hunter Biden and Absolutely. God, God knows how much uh, dirt there is in Ukraine, the, the Clinton Foundation all of these things that I exactly. think there are some people in DC and Brussels who are saying, you know what, um, if all this stuff gets discovered in Ukraine, well then yeah. I prefer to burn down the entire system than to have yeah. my, uh, my crimes revealed. And yes. I think they will, they, they prefer to burn yeah. down the United States than to have their, their dirt yeah. uh, discovered in Ukraine. I think I'm there is a component right. there as well. I think you're absolutely right. And I think that there is, I, to be honest, I, was, I think there was also something of a component to that in the pullout from Afghanistan last year. But I think you're absolutely right about Ukraine. I think Ukraine is obviously on a bigger scale, much bigger scale. Yeah, because you have to ask yourself, why, why so much emphasis and focus on Ukraine? The, the poorest nation in Europe, or, or the second to last poorest nation in, in Europe, the most corrupt nation in Europe as well, but yet you're building bio labs and you got you know the, the son of the president making eighty thousand a month and then you got the oligarchs who are the number one donors to uh, Hillary Clinton and and you've got the entire uh, Ukraine lobby, which is a very powerful lobby, yeah, uh, pushing hard to to remove yes. Trump and you have the yes. the Trump Zelensky yes. impeachment. I mean, yes, to me it just screams that that there is just so much inappropriate stuff going on in Ukraine that this whole invasion spooked them. Yeah, I completely agree with you. I, 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 I agree you're absolutely right with that. And I, I, I mean, I got nothing to add to it because I mean, we're yeah. in total agreement. Yeah. Uh, but Brother Man Billy says, uh, UN Bioweapons Lab Talks has finished minutes ago. Well, right. For yesterday, minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Nothing came out of it, uh, Alexander. No, I mean, I, I read, uh, I looked at the readouts. It was as we would expect. Oh, absolutely. Certain yeah. countries voted one way. Yeah. The other countries. No, absolutely. I mean, there was never any. There was never any chance that anything much would come of it at all. Um, I don't talk to be resolved at that level. Maybe one day. I think very likely one day we will find out exactly what was going on. I'll, I'll say two things on there. I think Russia has a lot more information that they're not uh, putting out there. So I think we've just seen the tip of the iceberg and they have a lot more info. And I thought it was interesting that the countries that voted for further investigation 
Uh, it was uh, China, India, Brazil. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and Kenya. China, and Kenya. India, Brazil, and Kenya. Maybe leaving one country out, but I thought yeah. that was an interesting group of countries that said, no, we need to investigate this. Absolutely. And can I just say, perhaps the most interesting of, this, of those is Kenya. Because bear in mind that Kenya has taken lots of different positions on this conflict. I mean, um, at one point when there was the... Uh, when the Russians went into Ukraine, they were extremely strong in denouncing it. And they seem to be shifting position um, on, on this side. But um, there's obviously an awful lot. And I think a lot of a lot of people, a lot of countries were very, very, have been very, very stunned by this. And um, the U.S. played into that, played into the Russians' hands here with this extraordinary statement by Victoria Nuland. I mean, you know, they could have just retreated behind outright denials. I mean, that might not have been a sustainable position to anybody who looked at the documents and was, you know, going through this forensically. But how many people actually do that? The media just reports the denials. It doesn't go any further than this. But this time, Victoria Nuland and Rubio, I think, went, whatever they were trying to do, it was too complicated. And I, I think that it basically was seen around the world. It was seen by me, by the way. When I say just not just around the world, it was seen by me as going very far to corroborate what the Russians were saying. This is coming from uh, Dan's men. Big mistrust, U.S. E evangelical dispensationalism have against Russia is that they actually think it is Gog slash Magog. In oh, I see. Walking I, I know what you're saying. Israel. Yeah. In reality, Russia are turning full Christian Orthodox. I, I, I think I, I know what this is all refers to. This, this is a, uh, uh, a view which uh, was adopted um, by some people, you know, some pe religious people in the United States from, um, um, you know, very, very evangelical Christians that, um, you know, we're, we're heading towards some kind of second covenant coming, that the events of the book of Revelations are become, you know, are, are likely to be real. And that if you know the book of Revelations, there is the advance of the armies of Gog and Magog onto Israel, um, which leads, I think, to the to Armageddon. And there's been a widespread belief amongst some of these people that Russia is, in fact, Magog. But, you know, that refers to Russia. So, I mean, I, you know, there, there, there is that around. I don't know how influential it is in the US. My own feeling is not very in all truth. But, you know, I'm not an expert on these kind of thinking. I mean, I think it's, an, I think it's utterly wrong. And, of course, you're absolutely right. The person who says that is absolutely right. Russia today is becoming a much more Christian country. In fact, it's becoming a very Christian country. So the idea that they would be on the side of, you know, the armies of darkness, if you like, in a great existential struggle just doesn't make any kind of sense to me. Yeah. T.S. Sarkozy, thank you for that super sticker. Sparky says the military-industrial complex must love Kamala. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure they do. Really? I'm sure. I'm sure they love. I mean, they adore her. Probably the only people who do. That's right. Rascal <laughs> Seven Seven says Duran plus Barnes. Can it get any better? Thank you very no. much for that super chat. Yeah. FL sixty four. Thank you for that super sticker. Etienne says I just started learning Russian again. I'm ordering books on Amazon and having Zoom meetings with Russian, with Russians in Russia. Will I be sent to the American Gulag? <laughs> Well, you might not be sent to the gulag, but you might find that before long, I'm afraid, Zoom calls are not possible with people yeah. in Russia. So, I mean, that, that, and it might become increasingly difficult to order Russian books, at least if this continues in the way it is at the moment for much longer. So that's, that's for me, the most um, worrying thing at the present time. I mean, I think you can, you can speak to people via Telegram and those sorts, you know, there are places like that where you, that will probably continue to work. But Zoom, I don't know. Yeah, Kaliu25 says, as a Romanian of Russian and Greek origins and living in Canada, I feel very isolated, ideologically speaking. These days, I don't know what I'd do without you, Alex and Alexander. Thank you. I understand the feeling completely. I mean, that is a very widespread, uh, I mean, of course, in Britain, it's the same. 
AD says, why would Iran try to reach an agreement with the USA and the JCPOA to lift sanctions? Do they really think that they are going back into that system after what is happening? I don't know what the Iranians are thinking. I think the Iranians are trying to cut a deal with the US to get sanctions lifted, not so much so that they can trade with the US or even the Europeans, but so that they can trade more deeply with the Eurasian powers. And I think that this Russian statement about, um, you know, that they want to be quite clear that any sanctions imposed upon them are not going to interfere with their trade with Iran was not, as some people think, a spoiler over the JCPOA. I suspect it was probably to some extent coordinated with some people in Iran, not everybody, some people in Iran uh, said they weren't happy with it. But I think it was partly coordinated with Iran because I think that the Russians and the Iranians have been forging lots of deals and I think that will continue and intensify. All right, Lon Baker says cheers and thanks. Gentlemen, Toilet Sauce says the bio labs Number one, the biolabs don't exist. Number two, of all the labs that don't exist, they are the safest. Number three, if Russia gets their hands on the labs that don't exist, they can make military-grade chemical weapons with them. Did I get that right? You got it exactly right. Exactly. By the way, can I just say, that's brilliant. That's very much uh, what's called in law amongst British lawyers, particularly British uh, uh, court lawyers, litigators. It's called pleading in the alternative. (laughs) It's, you know, there are no biolabs. In the alternative, if there are biolabs, they are entirely civilian. In the alternative, if they are, <laughs> if they are, in the, if they are not civilian, then what they do is completely safe and cannot be used by anybody. And in the alternative, if they are not safe and can be used, it is the Russians who are using them. It's called, as I said, pleading in the alternative. So it's brilliant, and it describes, I think, very well the cu- the current situation. Beltrain Cottage, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Harold Peterson, thank you for that super chat as well. And Sparky says, aren't they NAZIs rather than neo-NAZIs in Ukraine since their lineage goes back at least to World War II? I absolutely agree with that. I don't, I mean, I've always found the neo thing a little statement. bit odd, but it's a good point, actually. I think it's a very good point. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Trace it back to Bandera. Yeah. Which no one talks about no, of course, in the no. Western mainstream media. Let's no. <laughs> I've never, I uh, still haven't uh, seen, I mean, I mean, read, I, it's hard to do, but I read the British media regularly, and I've never seen the word Azov Battalion uh, appear anywhere in any British article that I've read over the last couple of weeks. Now, you know, I may have missed someone somewhere who mentioned it, but it certainly doesn't get much attention if it does, if it's mentioned at all. Mm-hmm. Um, AD says, they are in hysteria. Any confrontation will go under the title high or very high attrition warfare. Chemical or not, they are going to lose their forward bases, radars in eastern flank. A total shock. I think that's that's exactly the point. I mean, I think, by the way, I mean, it's very interesting to see that, you know, the Russian cruise missiles have been targeting radar stations. I mean, I just mentioned it, but I mean, you know, that's at least that's what the Russian defense ministry says. I mean, I don't know. Obviously, I can't verify this, but it's very interesting to see that in every account that they give of what they destroyed, they particularly focus on the radar stations. Brian says uh, DuckDuckGo has now said it will filter, rank, censor, etc. Russian sites, pro-Russian sites, sites that hint at being pro-Russian. It took 15 years to build a company and and one quote to destroy it. Yeah, absolutely true. And of course, you know, we have to think about that all the time. But there it is. I mean, you know, we, 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 it is. is inevitable, I think, in this kind of situation. Given, given the history, uh, given what's been happening over the last 20 years, I mean, the, 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 the rancor and the sort of build-up to this has taken a very, very long time. And in a way, I think, you know, we've, we've lanced the boil, or at least the boil has burst and all of this has come pouring out now. So maybe with the boil having burst, when all it, it all settles, you know, things might begin to settle a little bit, but you know, we'll see. Can I just say, however, and I want to reiterate again, this is very, very different from what used to happen during the Cold War. During the Cold War, 
we were very accessible in the West to Soviet propaganda. I remember it was all over the place. I mean, you could buy uh, uh, New Times, which is the Soviet publication, which was created to imitate Newsweek. You could buy it in kiosks in Athens. It wasn't difficult at all. And it was in English. And you could read it all there. And of course, you had you know, Radio Moscow beaming to us, and you could listen to it on shortwave radio. It was the other side that was imposing all the restrictions. And now it's different. And I really do find that very, very disturbing. And it does beg, beg a lot of questions about why are we imposing all these restrictions if we're so confident of, our, of the rightness well, of our cause. Mm -hmm. That's because the authoritarians now are in the... In the West. <laughs> I mean, well, indeed. I mean, you know, well, well, that's then, a good point, Soviet actually. I mean, they were in the, they were in the East. Now they're they in, were the in the West. The East, so, they've all moved to the know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They've migrated from the Kremlin. Is it? The, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. is is it? Uh, yeah. When you hate a a culture, and yeah. ethnicity, is it bigotry or racism? Is it, is what's the I correct term? That the hate I'm not for sure. Russians. I think. Well, I think it's bigotry. Um, well, Bigotry. I, mean, I think it's bigotry. I think it's bigotry. I'm out. I think it's bigotry. bigotry. Yeah, yeah. The the hate for for a certain country or yeah. a culture. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's what it is. Uh, yeah. Sparky says it's as if Newland, Pompeo, Bolton, and the like are part of a doomsday cult. Yeah, I agree with this actually, mm -hmm. and that's perhaps the most worrying thing of it of all about this. I mean, you know, we'll go back to what Robert Barnes said that you know the situation. I mean, it is extremely unlikely that anything really bad is going to happen because of what we were talking about, you know, the military being very much in control of things and, you know, level-headed people there who understand the dangers. But unfortunately, we can't say it's completely inconceivable. And that is an unsettling fact. And, um, you know, when we have people like Pompeo, Bolton and all the others uh, at Newland and all the rest... Well, I do sometimes think that these people are probably capable of pretty much anything. Right. Montri, thank you for that super sticker. Salila, thank you for that super sticker. Leopard Leo says, those NAZIs were on the street of Hong Kong when that riot took place. Really? Okay, well, I mean, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, I, I haven't been following everything there, but, you know. Ralph, thank you for that super chat. Nicholas says, uh, thanks, chat moderators, for keeping it civilized. Cheers. Thank you to our moderators, of course. Not a banned account says, what hope is there in these dark and economic times? Well, we will come through. I believe that. I mean, I really do generally believe that. And I'm going to give a, 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 a general observation. You know, we may go through some very, very bad and difficult times. But in a way, we've been going through bad times economically ever since the 2008 financial crisis. And in a way, all this is connected. I mean, all of these things that we're seeing happen are connected to that financial crisis, to the crisis of the globalization project. And if, and this we have to hope, because of course it could go in the other direction. But if we come out of this crisis and there's no great reset, then we could very well find ourselves in a much better, more stable situation than the one we've been in up to now, and a less repressive one. We could start to rediscover what is important in our society. So that's the hope. You asked me for hope. That's a, that's a hope rather than a prediction. All right. Z Zaka Strope says, great work. You guys are the voice of the people who never get heard, keep it up. Thank you for that. Mm. Etienne says, an economy is about to collapse, but it's not the Russian one. Mm. Well said, Etienne. Mm. Sparky says, Russia should rescue Zelensky from the NAZIs and keep him as head of the Ukraine government in exile, then return them after the NAZIs are purged from Ukraine. Uh, well, I mean, you know, I, 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 it's an interesting idea. I don't think it's that it, different, by the way, from some of the things that the Russians are talking about. I mean, I think that they want to separate Zelensky from, I'm going to call them the radicals, but you know, you, everybody knows whom I mean. I think that they want to try and separate Zelensky from the radicals and also to try and recreate a government around him. That may not be a practical project. And of course, it depends on Zelensky. And Zelensky strikes me as a very volatile and unstable character. I mean, he says one thing 
uh, as Robert Barnes correctly said, he reads from different scripts. So he says one thing to the British Parliament one day, he says something completely different to ABC. The next day, he says something different again to the Russians. He then contradicts himself. He's a very, very difficult person to work with. It's the drugs. I agree, actually. It's the drugs. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's the drugs. Yeah, and mm. and Zelensky has homes in in Miami, and he's he's not. Oh, going of course to he does. Yeah, go to Russia. Yeah. He's going to yeah. go to Russia. Kicking. By the way, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, well, I, well, that's absolutely right. I mean, I think that's so, so true. I, I mean, I don't think he wants to go end up there at all. By the way, Kerensky, you know, well, we've talked about, you know, you know, on our history chats and who, as I said, reminds me a lot, you know, uh, Zelensky reminds me a lot in many ways of, of Kerensky. Many people in the West also at the time found Kerensky inspirational. So many of the same things that you read about Kerensky, um, Zelensky, you would read about Kerensky back in those days. But of course, he, he, he did very well for himself. He ended up in the West. He was on all the lecture circuits. He got important academic positions. Obviously, the rewards in those days were not anywhere close to being as big as they are now. But I suspect that's probably the outcome that is the one that, you know, Zelensky, at the back of his mind, probably is thinking of. Mm. Yeah. Echoes Bunny Woman says, love you guys. Keep, keep me sane in these yeah. crazy times. Thank you for that. Yeah. Toilet Sauce says, being able to replace your losses, material and human, is more important from a logistical standpoint than minimizing losses. If you only focus on minimizing losses and you take an unexpected heavy hit, you're basically done. Absolutely correct. Excellent That's comment. totally correct. That's entirely right. And again... I mean, the, the, the Russian system is much more geared towards this. I mean, for example, they were not so much involved in the sort of just-in-time type of economic structure that we are. And, you know, they, they've always built, believed in building reserves of things that they can then release when they need them. And I think, you know, we'll probably find that that's working through the system as we're talking about. Juha says, hope the U.S. does not stage yet another false flag operation. Well, that's, I think we're all hoping <laughs> that some, nothing like that happens, obviously. I mean, I'm going to say something, I, I, and we were talking about this privately, Alex and I. I think we're closer to the point of some really ugly incident happening than we have ever been. And you can see many of the telltale signs, the discussions between the president and the media, with the, you know the you know the warnings again, and also uh, warnings that have been circulated across social media by platforms. I'm not going to name particular platforms that you know that uh, uh, those platforms stand ready to clamp down on any misinformation. So that always makes me ner very nervous when I hear about those things. Yeah, Boomer Fifty says thank you too for your honest and sober content. I actually. Uh, as some I actually SMH when I hear MSM, and now that you have Robert the Great, the team's complete. I agree. Thank, we thank we love that, we fifty. Yeah, uh, we love we love uh, being with Robert. By the way, and I mean it, 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 we really enjoy his the programs. But you know we and we're and we're broadening. I and mean, we we've had, we had Tom Longo also the other day, and that was a great live too. Yeah. Sparky says Putin deserves a Nobel Prize for ending the pandemic. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently. Yeah. I, I said a, a, a Hungarian friend told me, a, a, um, a British-based Hungarian friend told me that you can see uh, graffiti to that effect all over Budapest. Yeah. A lot of stuff is coming out about that stuff, but about the pandemic. And anyway, a lot of stuff, but it's all being drowned out by this Coincidence? I don't know. D David S., thank you for that super sticker. Catherine says, Barnes is best recommendation of all time that Duran does Blinken get booted after Afghanistan and now Ukraine and trying to push Poland into war. Well, one would love to think so. But, you know, as we've discussed so many times on so many programs, not just in the <laughs> EU, but in the West today, the more you fail, the more you get promoted. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the most... I mean, really, the whole... Um, the whole business of the MiG fighters, which first Burrell and then Blinken cooked up between them, 
I mean, it, it just leaves me speechless. It's so farcically absurd and misconceived that, you know, the Secretary of State of the United States could be involved in something like that. Just, just, just stunned me. But there we go. He's still there. I, and I firmly expect him to be. And so is Burrell. Absolutely. And they're going to get promoted. Pasha says, uh, at Robert Barnes, the other, the other reason to put labs in Ukraine is that you don't really care what happens to innocent bystanders. Well, of course, that's right. Yeah. Very true. Sparky says, Ukraine was left a shell by Western carpetbaggers. Oh, also, very true. also true. Yeah. Uh, Lamont says, thank you, gentlemen, the voice of sanity in an insane world. Thank you, Lamont, for that. Sparky says, election fraud is at the root of it all. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Uh, Tim, thank you for that super sticker. Uh, Vicky I'm Rosny, just I think some, I'm sticker. just going to add something. Yeah. I'm just going to add something to that, by the way, which is one point where I'm not sure I agree with Robert Barnes. He was talking about impeachment, and he was suggesting that if there was an impeachment of the president, then it would relate to Ukraine. I wonder whether if there is going to be an impeachment after the midterms, it's more likely, more plausibly going to relate to the point that you've just floated. Because I would have thought that's something that would have more traction with the American people than uh, uh, anything connected to Ukraine. But, you know, I, I, I defer to Robert Barnes what did I on American what? issues. In other words, I mean, in other words, in bringing up the question of elections, how the election was conducted, and all of those sort of things. Oh, from Sparky. That much. What Sparky yeah. floated. Okay. Exactly, okay. exactly. He was. You mean an impeachment was, based on, on an all impeachment the shenanigans based on that from the exactly, election. exactly, exactly. Now, I, yeah, that's. Now, I can't. I can't say that for certain because I don't know what's going to happen, and I don't even know that there's going to be an impeachment. Though I think it's highly likely if the Republicans sweep the House uh, and do well in the Senate. But I would have thought that that's probably more what the uh, Republican base will be looking for than um, the Ukraine issues, which I don't think, frankly, engage them very much. All right. Uh, Mariana, thank you for that super sticker. Yaroslav says 8,000 watching. Hit that like button. Thank you for that uh, super chat, Yaroslav. Sparky says, if only Eisenhower had warned us. <laughs> well said, Sparky. Um, <laughs> Yaroslav also That's says, brilliant. Lick the that, is so brilliant. that is so brilliant. <laughs> you know, he's the last president to give that warning. And as uh, Robert Barnes also said, you know, you get warnings all the way back to George Washington, the most famous one being about, you know, from John Quincy Adams about, you know, not going out for monsters to slay in case we become a monster ourselves and it's interesting you know eisenhower said that and you know that was the american tradition that was the american tradition which made america that was how america it minded its own business its business was business famously as another u.s president said and it prospered and became strong and it became the democracy you know somehow all of that all of that got lost uh, and you don't hear it any longer. Yaroslav also says, lick the hate button, boys. <laughs> Thank you, Yaroslav, for that. And Sparky says, I wonder if Pompeo still has Trump fooled. I don't think so. I think the two have gone uh, part of the wet their ways, actually. But that's my own guess. I mean, you know, we'll see, we'll see what Trump does. We'll see how it turns out. Yeah, Trump's making a lot of statements with uh, this conflict. And, Absolutely. Uh, I don't yeah. know. My opinion on uh, on Trump's statements is that once again he's he's trying to gain favor favor with the neocons, and I, I just know, yeah. don't understand his fascination no. with Bolton and no. McConnell and and all these neocons. All those he's, he's got all those Lindsey Graham. Trump's got some. Yeah. It's like he's got a, a a desire to be liked by these neocons to be in their inner yes, circle. Yes, I know. I, uh, I just don't um, get it. I, I I read a brilliant book about Trump by uh, uh, York, by uh, um, the, the, the writer of the, who writes for Washington uh, Byron Examiner, York. Byron York. And he, he actually said that Trump's fundamental weakness is that he wants to be liked by people. He has this idea that he can win them over with his charm. He does actually have in person an enormous amount of charm, apparently. And that he's, he's somebody who very much wants to be liked it's a kind of compulsive compulsion. And of course, it, 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 it leads him to disaster. And the example Byron York gave 
uh, of that was that Trump did that with, of all people, James Comey. He thought he could win Comey over. Well, we all know what the result of that was. Sparky says, I'll bet the Zimmerman telegram, which got the U.S. into World War I, was a false flag. U.S. often falls for false flags. Our memories are too short. I wouldn't be... I wouldn't be surprised. It's a strange business. The whole Zimmerman telegram is a very, very old business. But was it even, to be straightforward about this, a legitimate reason, even, even if it was real, was it even a legitimate reason to go to war? It's quite clear that Woodrow Wilson, I think, had always intended to bring the United States into the First World War. That's my own reading of um, American history, which I once studied and studied in great detail. Uh, Tom Tom 73 says, great analysis. Gentlemen, by the way, Russia Today's channel is still available on odyssey.com. Yes, it is. On Rumble as well. You can find yeah, yeah. a yeah. stream of RT. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rolf says, just read an op-ed piece by Gorka in which he rhetorically fellated Zelensky. Not so cool as I thought. Parsing, not easy. No, no, yeah. Well, I'm, I haven't Gork seen Gorka's that. a neocon. <laughs> yeah. He's also a neocon. That's my opinion anyway. Yeah. Um, so it doesn't. Nothing surprises me there. No. Uh, Sparky says U.S. elite culture comes from New England. Yeah, I think that's true, and I think ultimately it comes from England. You know, this is a. I mean, not not New England. I mean, old England. W w one of the things, if you spend any time with American elite people, and I did, once upon a time. I, 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 I had to deal with a lot of people who, for, you know, the very um, elite um, um, law firms, the New, the New York law firms, which is very connected to the London ones. And one of the things that really, really struck me is how the elite class tries to imitate the British elite class. They, they wear the same kind of clothes. They try and set up the same kind of clubs. They've recreated to an extraordinary degree the British elite education system, you know, the public schools, which are not public schools that we have in England. But the Americans have done the same things with all kinds of schools that they have, similar schools in the US, even some of the Ivy League universities, uh, you know, which were quite different at one time, have been sort of reconstructed, reconstituted into kind of Oxbridge type institutions. And... Um, I, I going back to that comment I made um, with Robert Barnes um, about the impeachment, especially the first Trump impeachment. I was really quite amazed at how the extent to which um, people were citing English precedents in relation to impeachment proceedings, as if impeachment in the United States was anything like what impeachment was like in Britain before the 19th century. And they are completely different because the American system is a Republican one. It's a democracy. The Constitution is a revolutionary document. It is a repudiation of what Britain was. And bringing in British precedents, all done, by the way, by lawyers who were trying to impeach Trump, um, struck me as being... Again, another example of the, of the fascination the American elite has with the British. Sparky says, U.S. Uh, I've just read that. Uh, J.K. says, Dershowitz has some good vids, don't agree 100%, but goes no. through the history of Ukraine and them throwing around. Yahtzee is insane because they were the ones doing the atrocity alongside. Look who were the guards at the camps. I don't like Dershowitz at all. He's somebody that, I, you know, I'm sure that if we were ever to meet, we'd be arguing very quickly. <laughs> Not that we're ever likely to meet. I don't like him. He's also an extremely clever man. He's a brilliant lawyer. And he's somebody who has many, many uh, um, good insights um, I, I want to stress again, he's not my person, and I still think he's got questions to answer in relation to what happened with his connections with Epstein. That's all I'm going to say. Irving, thank you for that uh, super chat. And Talix001 says, 
Media hides American allied casualties because the plebes might take it out on Americans who share the enemy's ethnicity until this war. I think there's a, that's also true, by the way. But, you know, I, I, I'm sure that's right, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of, um, you know, by the way, I'm sure there's a lot of Americans um, in Ukraine, probably contractors and people of that kind. Um, sooner or later, some of them will be captured. <laughs> Um, Sparky says Putin and Modi may be the last hopes against globalism. I think that's, I think there's some point in this, actually. I mean, India has really excelled itself in this crisis. Mm -hmm. yeah, no doubt about that. Uh, JK says, uh, oh yeah, the whole denial thing that Yahtzee problem is Russia lies is crazy because there is a statue in Street of Bandera plus media covered it one year ago. Yeah, it's true. I know, Street I know. Absolutely. This is all, all completely the true. <laughs> There's, it's all over the place. I mean, you know, this is this is not this is hidden in plain sight. <laughs> if I can put it like that. I mean, you know, I I'm not. Uh, I don't want to give the impression that more than a very small minority of Ukrainians are of those views, but though it's a small minority. It's a much bigger minority than you'd find anywhere else. And it's a very powerful one. Very powerful. And it's very integrated uh, in the state here. structures. Yeah. From uh, Odyssey, we have Kurwas, who sent us an Odyssey super chat. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Kurwas and uh, Waldo says, I wish there was a way to communicate these, I these ideas to the brainwashed masses. Well, we can. I agree on that one. I agree with that. <laughs> I wish there was. A but way. I mean, you know, I, I, I get to say yeah. something. I think in here, I've been, I've been, you know, following very closely um, um, the sort of discussion and traffic and things of this kind. And it always strikes me that in, if you go to Britain, it's monolithic. There isn't anybody in Britain who talks <laughs> the way we do. You know. Uh, oh, has has willingness to look at things from different perspectives, uh, uh, looks for explanations, engages in real analysis. You're starting to see some articles, Simon Jenkins, uh, Martin Kettle in the Guardian, for example. You can sense that deep down they got they've got concerns. Is there even one by Gideon Rackman in the Financial Times? But overall, it's very monolithic in Britain. You have far more interesting and widespread debate in the United States. And I think that in the US, because it's so big, because it's got the Republican and Democrat tradition, because there's the First Amendment, and because, to be straightforward about it, it's a much more technologically sophisticated society. So people have many more means to communicate with each other. You have a far less of a population that is... Um, influenced in the way that you've just said mm -hmm. justin says ukraine plays caliber missiles with old soviet era drones for a false flag operation to drag other countries into its own mess hungary was observed mid-friday twice drones approaching its airspace that's from rome this is so interesting it's a very very good point and that my I, i'm not saying you know you've got it exactly right but there is these archaic soviet drones left over from the 60s with you know, jet powered drones which were you know in the in the 60s and 70s they were no doubt you know the absolute um you know cutting edge of technology but today they're absolutely archaic and they're suddenly appearing in places like croatia overflying hungary and all the rest and you know i i did wonder what was all that what what all that was about the the the, the russian military apparently I mean, it's long since pensioned those particular types of drones off. And it's difficult to imagine that the Ukrainians use them for surveillance because apparently there's intelligence sharing with the US, so why would they need to? So it seems to me much more plausible that the explanation is the one you've just given. They've actually run out of the Turkish drones as well, though. They're trying to get a new shipment. I've heard that, yeah. I've heard that, yeah. So I wonder what Putin's going to tell Erdogan about that. Oh, well, indeed. Anyway, uh, TV Lars, thank you for that uh, super chat, or, or Rumble Rant, I believe it's what it's called. Thank you very much for that. And um, another one from Rumble, uh, Rasputinish says, do any of you think Tulsi Gabbard has a chance if she tries 
running for the presidency again in 2024. It's quite likely she will gain significant support through her appearances on Tucker Carlson's show. I'm not close enough to the action to um, to know. I think it's most unlikely. I mean, presumably she'd want to run as a Democrat or as an independent. She's got no chance as a Democrat. The DNC would just freeze her out as they did before. If she tried to run as a independent, well, independents find it very difficult in the US. And she's also damaged herself terribly by her endorsement of Biden in the last election. I don't even know if they'll let Trump run. Yeah, I don't. Given what they've I, done I to Russia, with... all I, of this I, to I, me, I, they're going to turn to be it honest, against I, anybody that's that's out of the system in the U.S. To as be well. honest, everything I agree they've with... done to Russia, everything yeah. they're going to refocus it back into the United States. I, 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 I agree. Everyone with that. that's to cheering be this on in the U.S., you're cheering on your own demise. Demise. Can I just say something? I agree with that completely. And um, there's this individual. I'm not going to name him because I don't have his permission, but. Both Robert and I are on his very extensive mailing lists, and he's been making exactly that point. Yeah. Le chat, thank you for that super chat. Uh, Barbara Cavallo, thank you for that super sticker. J.K. Wynn says, I'm sure a deal with Putin will be after the $14 billion of aid gets sent and distributed throughout all the banks and shell companies, then watch for book deals. Exactly correct. I mean, this is so true. I mean, Ukraine has received billions I mean, if it had been used in the way people said, it would, it would be a rich country. It should be a rich country anyway. Just pouring more money in that, like that. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me again of Afghanistan. It's, uh, uh, and, and the fact that at the very end, what they did was they used the money from the central bank, the Afghan central bank, to uh, uh, um, pay off all the people in the NGOs and the think tanks and all of those things. And I wonder whether the same is going to happen, by the way, to the Russian central bank's money, whether at some point we're going to see an executive order seizing it and redistribute, redistributing it to all the usual people. And that's, you know, about two to three hundred billion dollars, apparently. Not, not three and a half. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Tony says thank you in his super chat thank you for that Imre says uh, just sends a super chat thank you Imre for that and Sparky says remember uh, Micah's dad lured Russia into Afghanistan Micah Brzezinski yes oh, yeah, very true yeah absolutely very very true yeah very, that's why she has don't the think of that Afga- I think one should be very careful be- between making comparisons by the way between the Afghan and Ukrainian wars I think they're radically and profoundly different one of the fundamental differences, which is not just that you know, uh, um, Russians care about um, Afghanistan, uh, uh, Ukraine in a way that they never did about Afghanistan, because Russians know Ukraine in a way that they never knew Afghanistan. So it's it's, it's a profoundly different scenario. I think people should be very careful about making these kind of comparisons. Mm-hmm. Igor says, what if some countries would stop paying IMF loans? Well, in theory, if you stop paying an IMF loan, then, I mean, you are not able to borrow, period. (laughs) So that's up to now been the deterrent because most countries want to um, borrow eventually from someone. Now... We are, and this is, I think, one of the fundamental misconceptions about the sanctions. Um, We are now in a completely different economic world. And um, I think a lot of the sanctions, the policies that have been done over the last couple of years, not just towards Russia, are predicated on assumptions that the West is the world economy in the way that it was until the 19. 90s and 2000s. And I think it's very difficult for some policymakers to understand that that just isn't the case anymore. Um, if that money, that central bank money, is seized in yeah. order to pay off the, yeah. the bankers and the elite class, if it's seized from Russia, which is something that they may do, like they did to Afghanistan, yeah. what does Russia do in retaliation? Does it... Uh, confiscate all the assets of the Western uh, firms in Russia? 
Well, I wonder. I mean, you said it's two hundred billion. Yeah, you know, two well, three hundred billion, perhaps. I mean, we're talking billion. about a huge amount of money, but you know, I'm not. I, I, I I'm not going to try and guess what the Russians are going to do. Uh, well, Russia's I mean, not just going to take that. No, they're I mean, not going to take it. They're not going just going it's to not take Afghanistan. it. Afghanistan. They're, they're not just going to sit there and say, "Okay, take no. the money and, and steal it from us." No, I know, I know, I know. But I mean, the implications of doing something like that, even if the Russians were to do nothing, would be awesome. I mean, I, I mean, what they did already was awesome, but I mean, it would be even more awesome. <sighs> Sparky says the few well-meaning elites lack the healthy cynicism of regular people, so they are easily bamboozled by their evil peers. Some people are like this. I, you know, I feel a little bit, you know, I, I, I've been watching Annalena Baerbock, who is, as I said, essentially, she's young, activist type. I think that's exactly right. I think she's she's led along. She believes that she's on the side of good and right. She doesn't have that worldliness that you really need in order to really run things well. And you know, not just, when I say worldliness, I don't mean cynicism, which is a completely different thing. I think I, what I mean is an understanding of people and a, a, an understanding that you know things are not black and white. People have their rights, people have their concerns, and you have to work with people in order to achieve good outcomes. And I think that um, some of these, I'm not, you know, I don't know, I, I, maybe I'm being too generous to Pierre by the way. But I mean, I think there may be some element of that in some of the reactions that we're seeing on the part of some people. But if we're talking about the elite as a whole, then be very clear, they are profound profoundly cynical people. The very fact that they don't report to us about some of the things we've been talking about, you know, the Azovs and all that, I mean, that tells you that they know exactly what they're doing. Duncan Chino says, is Indian news the most objective in this conflict? Is Indian news the most objective in this conflict? I haven't been following it very much, if I have to say. It's pretty objective, but in yeah. But I think it's been pretty balanced, absolutely, and very objective, actually. There was an Indian journalist who went around Kiev <laughs> and debunked one story after another. And, of course, we haven't seen anything of him, his reports in the West. Uh, Bauke says, can we get a brief evaluation of Olaf Scholz? I can give you a very brief evaluation of Olaf Scholz. Dim. <laughs> I think he's... Rather unintelligent. But I think he's very unintelligent. He is the worst chancellor Germany has had since the Second World War. Zariel says, Alexander, you said that so very nicely. They believe they are the new aristocrats and are heading to repeat history. I'll just say France, 1700s. I agree with that, yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, Zariel. And uh, DR Freak says, has shale oil production and the banks that fund it been discussed? They must be making a killing at the moment. Yeah, I'm sure they are. And I'm sure they are. But of course, um, I'm not an expert on geologies, uh, or oil uh, production, all of those sort of things. But, you know, again, I understand that um, shale has simply for physical reasons in the United States essentially peaked. I mean, it's perhaps got a little way up that it could still go. But you're at the top of the curve and it will start to fall off now. So, you know, they're making a killing at the moment, but it's going to be very difficult to sustain. That's what I understand. FL64, thank you for that super sticker. And Commando Crossfire says, will the Northern Arctic shipping route still be economically viable and profitable for Russia if Europe loses, in, loses purchasing power? Well, uh, that is a very good question. And there's been a lot of discussion about this, by the way. Um, I understand both in Russia and in China as well. You know, what are the implications of all of this going to be for the Northern Sea Route? If Europe retains some purchasing power, which I think it will ultimately. I mean, you know, the Chinese can still use it. They can still send their ships around. I mean, the Chinese merchant ships are not sanctioned. So they can still go to Europe through the Northern Sea Route. 
But of course, the other point about the Northern Sea Route, which is, I think, the, in some ways, perhaps as important, is that it's the way to send raw materials from Russia's far north or liquefied natural gas, um, the very strategic minerals there, nickel, for example. You know, we were going through a nickel crisis, by the way. You can send those by ship through the Northern Sea Route to China, to the Chinese, uh, uh, to the northern ports in China. And that, it seems to me, is still the case. Mm -hmm. Zariel says, uh, the American, as well as most Western NATO countries, political infrastructures are so corrupt that it is bound to end nasty one day. Yeah, I agree with that. I'm afraid. I'm, I, I can remember a time when corruption, political corruption, was very rare in Britain. It's now become pervasive in ways that I would never have imagined. And of course, if you're talking about the United States, well, it's a different order of magnitude again. I mean, you know, Clinton foundations and all that. Kickjack says, please have Manico 64 on to talk history of empire's money problems, history of bankers, gold standards, pros, cons. He knows most of the Russian Ukraine stuff. All right. Interesting. We'll, okay. We'll reach out to Manico 64. Thank you for that. Commander Crossfire says, do you think the rising cost of living in the West caused by these sanctions will lead to a collapse in the economies and an economic depression? Well, we, we've already been discussing the prospect of stagflation. And I think I think that now is all but baked in the cake. I think it's now it's, it's almost all but inevitable. I, I, I was reading an article by Liam Halligan in the Daily Telegraph, one of the few people who talks rationally. And he said that, you know, double digit inflation is now certain. And I think it was Robert Barnes. I think it was Robert Barnes. It might have been Tom Longo who said that, in fact, no, I think it was Robert, it was Robert Barnes, who said that in reality, the the rate of inflation in the US now is already what it was under Carter, and that was the highest ever. So we are already in a high, in a, in a high inflation situation. And high inflation caused by supply problems on top of monetary problems is a massive crash on demand. Now, usually if you reduce demand, then prices fall. But if supply constraints are so big that prices remain high, then the fact that you're going to get reduced demand because people have less money to spend because the prices are so high means inevitably a recession and a bad one and an intractable one. Ralph Reed says, Alexander Vindman is such an REMF, real echelon mf -er. <laughs> The Ukrainian government twice asked him to be their defense chief, but he preferred to cosplay in his dress blues in the West Wing. Well, of course, he was, he was far, more, power chief, far more powerful there, wasn't he? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, if he'd just been defense minister, what difference would he have made? <laughs> but in, 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 in the National was, Security Council, he could pull all the levers where it really mattered. Yeah, let's not forget that uh, Valerie Juresko, an American citizen, was appointed as the finance mm, minister absolutely, absolutely. after the coup. Absolutely. How about that? <laughs> All right. Kevin W. says, congrats on the twins. Thank you for Thank keeping you me sane. Thank you very much. And uh, Yaroslav says. Thanks. Thanks for that. Yeah, go on. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Yaroslav says. Uh, Yaroslav said. Yeah. I, I have the questions in front of me, so I, I can't see you, actually. So I'm just listening to you. That's um, why. So I understand you. Some, okay. uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Yaroslav says, uh, anyone seen the like button recently? Thank, thank you, Yaroslav, for that. And uh, John Cheeseman says, I upset a few Ukrainians yesterday, and they talked about the Holodomor event, where Stalin starved tens of thousands of Ukrainians, then gave their properties to Russians. Well, the Holodomor, the famine in Ukraine is real. <laughs> it's absolutely crazy clear about this and the uh, famine but the famine was not just limited to ukraine as well it, there was also famine in russia there was very very bad famine in kazakhstan and it was all um driven by stalin's uh, policy of collectivization in other words um seize 
the peasants lands their 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 plots of land and force the let the peasants into collective farms um where they would share all their land together and peasants opposed it all over the former soviet union and many of them killed their livestock and many of them refused to resist it being pushed into these collective farms and it caused massive disruption to agriculture across the soviet union and the result was a famine now was this done by stalin specifically targeting ukrainians i have to say i am skeptical i've always taken the view that stalin did this not because he was a russian nationalist remember he wasn't even russian he was georgian i think he did this because he had a class ideological perspective he wanted to destroy private property in russia he wanted to destroy the private property owning peasant class in russia and that was why he drove them all into collective farms and when you say that he gave the property of the peasants in ukraine to russia that's new to me to russians that's new to me what he did was he created these collective farms and that happened in ukraine it happened in belarus it happened in russia it happened in the caucasus it happened in central asia it happened in all parts of the soviet union the people who gained control of the land were in effect the communist party and its apparatus mm. guy says is there is there evidence besides the victoria newland call that implicates the us in the 2014 ukraine revolution oh i think there's ample Hunts. evidence i mean the, 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 i mean the tons i mean you know the for, for heaps <laughs> i mean uh, i mean you know, john I mean, mccain showing up on maidan absolutely absolutely i mean european officials also along with american ones uh, i mean the, 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 it, it, you could uh, richard sackwer has written a good book on this i mean you know you, there's lots of it i don't is any i think this is really controversial yeah i i think if if you were to ask obama or joe biden was there a coup in ukraine they would say yeah absolutely yeah, <laughs> I mean, absolutely. in so many words yeah. maybe you know deflect a little bit but you know i, I don't think yeah. this is controversial at all yeah. yeah uh g g jetta says uh, yesterday the white house briefed 30 tiktok stars on the war unfolding in ukraine from the west wing to tiktok these are not serious people i absolutely agree with this i mean this is silly i mean you know in these giant events but what it does show again is the extent to which they're overwhelmingly focused on pr these guys i mean everything revolves around pr for them mm -hmm. gossip rumors this is this is the Absolutely. war they're fighting yeah. gossip Absolutely. rumors hate yeah. Well, exactly. well, I I have to say I I read I go to you know we, I I try we try to go to uh, to try to establish what's actually going on in the war. And by the way, we look at multiple sources. I mean, we don't just go to any particular you know, from any one particular country. And it's not easy. But uh, then I go to the British and American media and it's all anecdotal. It's all, you know, person does this here person does that there you know somebody you know turns back the russian army you know waving a broomstick or something i mean i mean i, I obviously i'm being a bit i i'm over over egging it but you don't get a real sense of what's going on in terms of the military balance and the strategies alex by the way and he's done another brilliant update in which he made precisely that point again about the fact that you know they 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 talk about a war in one place when the actual war is being fought in another they talk about you know the situation in kiev they focus on kiev they don't look at the real place where the real fighting is going on which is in eastern and southern ukraine uh marian says please explain what's going on with the government sanctioning roman abramovich i've heard it's because he supports putin a scary time to have all this hatred for russia and russians actually alexander before you comment on that it's much bigger than abramovich absolutely. you would have to be absolutely crazy if you're a multi-millionaire or billionaire at this moment in time to trust your money to uh to the absolutely. western financial system that's just my take i i i i'm going to say this i mean i am i'm abramovich who doesn't particularly support Putin, by the way. I mean, they're, they're not on; they're not enemies. 
and, and Abramovich was for a while a, while a governor of a, a re, a, of an eastern region in Russia. But, I mean, he's based, based in London for ages and ages. But I have to say I am profoundly shocked. I mean, these people have committed no known crimes. They've not been charged with any crimes. And yet they're having their assets seized, their properties seized, their, their, their clubs, their bank accounts. I mean, this is confiscation on a scale I've never known. And there's no legal recourse, apparently, because sanctions can't be challenged, so it seems, in courts. I mean, it's just astonishing things. And it is the collapse of any respect for private property rights. And it's discriminatory it's as well, because it, it's targeted at the moment on one ethnicity. Yeah, but it's going to affect all kinds of Absolutely. very high net worth wealthy people. They're going to start Absolutely. questioning where their assets are in the West. Absolutely. No doubt about yes. it. Absolutely. They're going to start moving Absolutely. money around. Absolutely. Yes. That's exactly what they're going to do. Uh, JJHW says Russia has said the seizing of the Russian central bank funds is a default. Is it possible to wind up the banks that defaulted? Uh, very complex question. Um, let, let's talk with the, about the first thing. I think it is a default. In fact, I don't think it's, I don't just think it. I mean, legally speaking, I don't think there's any question about this. I mean, if if you put your money in an institution, that institution owes you your money. And if they refuse to pay it back, that is a de that is a default. So I mean, there's no, there's absolutely no doubt about that at all. Now, does the fact that they've defaulted towards you mean that you are entitled to default to them? Bear in mind that them might be actually someone different. Well, I think in legal terms, the answer is probably no, but that might be what will in practice happen. I will say that the Russians caught everybody by surprise on Thursday when there was a universal expectation that um, Gazprom and various other uh, big Russian corporates, which owed dollar bonds, um, which had, you know, to, 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 the, the, the money matured liabilities on on bonds, on euro bonds and dollar bonds, uh, um, um, came up for payment on Thursday. There was a universal expectation that they would default on them, and they didn't. They paid in full, and we'll we'll see how this happens. But that it is a default. Russia so far has not defaulted. The Western powers have defaulted through this extraordinary action that they have taken. I, I don't think this is it's not obviously reported in that way in the West, but that is the reality. Mm -hmm. PDX Tiddy said, uh, at what point do you think Russia will tell the EU no more fossil fuel for you? Mm. Very good question. Only a question of time. I'm not sure how long it will take. I mean, the Russians are building their, three, their two more pipelines to China. And they've got all kinds of things happening with India. And, of course, they've also now got liquefied natural gas facilities in the Arctic, which will also be going towards Asia. And, you know, they can also send oil via their tankers to Asia too. I think that they will be careful not to hurt themselves by rushing too quickly to do this. I think they calculate, rightly, that, you know, keeping money flows into Russia is probably of more use to them. And in the meantime, the Western powers are already hurting themselves by higher energy prices. So what I think the Russians are going to do is I think they're going to gradually unravel all the contracts, you know, as the long-term contracts start to expire. They won't be review renewed. And within a period of time, and it won't take long, uh, a year, two, perhaps, we will see no more Russian oil or gas heading to Europe. That's my prediction. Ronald says, Alex Berenson claims that the biolabs were just make-work programs for unemployed Russian pathology scientists who they were afraid would work for the Iranians. And why keep them secret? After 30 years of the, since the end years? of the Soviet yeah. Union, you have to keep this going for 30 years? I, 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 I find that, frankly... 
an unbelievable argument. And if that was all it was, why not publicly say so all the time? Why not say, you know, why, why, why not simply say, you know, you're paying these people to do all sorts of useful things? Why keep it all secret in the way that it was be kept secret? And why would Newland say that she's worried that the Russians are going to get these these labs if, no, if no. this was just make well, work? Indeed. Well, indeed. Well, exactly. I mean, the, 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 the host, that, that, that story doesn't make any kind of sense to me. Danish says, uh, do you think the Russians will go much beyond the Dnieper River? I am not going to even try to guess. I had, I, I mean, so much has happened that has been so unexpected that I'm not going to try and guess what the Russians are going to do. Um, two people, very different people, uh, Gonzalo Lira and Scott Ritter, both think that they will go west all the way to Lviv. Um, others I know think otherwise. Who am I to guess one way or the other? Hmm. Uh, Nikki Haley is over the edge these days. In her recent TV appearance, she was yelling hysterical epitaphs at what was, it was, at, it was embarrassing. Hard to believe she was Trump's UN ambassador. Well, indeed, but I did. I found her hard to believe as a UN ambassador when she was UN ambassador. I mean, I remember yeah. her showing off photos and doing all kinds of weird and wonderful things. It's awful, Neocon, awful yeah. performance. Yeah, you know? I know. It's Trump's weakness. Are those neocons, Alton's, Haley's? Uh, Ronald said, is Tucker Carlson going to last on Fox? Disparity between uh -huh. him and virtually everyone else, including his friend Hannity, is getting wider all the time. He's a very brave man. That's all I get to say. Mm -hmm. All I will say is this also. If, if Fox gets rid of him, I mean, isn't that the end of Fox? Maybe I'm exaggerating. I mean, I don't know. But yeah, I think I, I know a lot, a lot of people who go to Fox because Tucker is on it. Exactly. Uh, JJHW says, long supply chains will start to collapse if this inflation continues as corporates that have fixed price contracts start to go bankrupt because they cannot afford to fulfill them. I wonder whether you've actually worked in logistics uh, or perhaps in the legal side of logistics because you've made an extremely good point. I used to work in logistics on the legal side, but you're absolutely right. And you're starting to see as a result, uh, um, because prices are rising and people are on fixed, some contracts are on fixed prices. Or the whole thing begins to ju become jumbled in a, in a high inflation environment. And you start to see things start to seize up. And it's going to be exactly as you say. People don't understand that one effect of inflation is that it creates shortages. And that, of course, gives another spike to inflation. Eventually, things get unscrambled at an even higher price. And then, of course, that create, recreates the whole problem all over again. But you are absolutely right about this. And just to go back to a point I made over the program, the live with Ro uh, Robert Burns, I'm already starting to notice problems with certain goods that they're starting to disappear from uh, um, uh, London sh supermarket shelves. Um, I, I had to spend, my, my wife and I had to spend several days to get adequate supplies of baby milk. I mean, in powder, powder baby prices. milk. Yeah. No, sorry? Uh, and, and, I mean, that was a product which, you know, was just, uh, there were never any problems with it. Carry on. Okay. Uh, Danish says, if prices skyrocket in coming months, there will be violence on the streets. Americans do have a low pain threshold when they can't provide basics, shelter and food for their kids. Well, indeed. And so will Europeans. And I gather there's already rumblings in Italy, for example. Uh, O'Brien, uh, sorry, O'Brien, T1, says, if it's a long-term plan to ban Russian oil and gas coming to the U.S., then Biden needs to reopen the pipelines he's shut down. Yeah, no, absolutely. I completely agree. And maybe that's what he should have done. Maybe he shouldn't have been importing all that oil from Russia in the first place. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm not a shill for the Russians. I mean, there's maybe what he needed to do, uh, um, you know, from an energy security point of view, was to keep the Keystone Pipeline going and to do to follow along with all the kind of things that 
uh, uh, you know, Trump before him was doing. I, you know, I'm not an expert on these things, but maybe that's that was the correct way. All I am saying is closing the Keystone Pipeline had consequences. Switching off Russian oil imports now also has consequences. And you sometimes have to make a choice. To govern is to choose. What Biden is doing is he's not prepared to make those choices. Hmm. Danish, the government is to choose, exactly. Uh, Danish says uh, Carter's loss was that he appeared to be ineffectual over the occupation of the U.S. Iranian embassy. Failed special forces operation. Indeed, and you know, it's not so very different from Biden. Can I make a simple point here? If the war ends in Ukraine in exactly the way that we have said, we're predicting, and you know, I'm confident about our predictions, then he's going to look ineffectual as well. Because the rationale for all of this is to prevent that. But he won't have prevented it. So what does he do then? Uh, the media is going to cover for him. Um, uh, Brian oh, well, of T1 course says, they did, which they I didn't think... for which they didn't for Carter. Again, that's another difference. In Carter's time, the media was still overwhelmingly Democrat, but there was there still was more independent thinking then than there is today. Yeah, Brian T1 says, I think the closer it gets to the truth coming out of Ukraine, the worse the propaganda gets. Absolutely, of course. Always does. It also, it also doesn't just, 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 just become the volume gets bigger, uh, uh, but it becomes more shrill. Hmm. Uh, JH, JJHW says, the city of London, for those that do not know, is not part of the UK. It's an independent city state. The queen is not monarch there and has to be invited in. That is perfectly is that true? true. She is, well, not entirely true. She is monarch. She is, I mean, the city of London is part of Britain, but it has particular liberties which go back all the way to the early Middle Ages. And it's absolutely right. In order for the Queen to enter the City of London, she has to have an invitation from the Mayor and Corporation. So that's that's the that's that is the point. Of course it has its own police force, it has many of its own regulations, its regulatory structure. It's different from Wall Street. Wall Street is part of New York City, and New York City is part of the state of New York, which is part of the United States of America. The city of London is, to a very great extent, self-governing. I used to just work. I used yeah. to work there, and I would just to say one thing: um, when I was working in the Royal Courts of Justice. The Royal Court of Justice is located on the borderline between the city of London and London, huh? which are politically two different entities. And the dividing line went right through my office. So I could literally sit with one foot in London and one foot in the city. Interesting. <laughs> Lord, Lord Justicost says, uh, Zero Hedge, title, Biden, NATO conflict would be World War III, warns Kremlin of severe price if chemical weapons used. Yes, yeah, the second part of that title that worries me. Yeah. Uh, Gre Grekanica says, it was announced at the UN Security Council this morning that the Russian Ministry of Defense has the evidence that research on uh, COOF and bats among the diseases in animals was being carried out in the Ukraine research facilities. And the Chinese media are full of this. I'd have to see this information before I could judge it. And again, we come back to the point that Alex was making. Several countries, India, Brazil, Kenya, China, obviously, wanted more investigation. Unsurprisingly, some people didn't. Uh, Chola says, what about fortifying the elections? Do you think there can be a fair election again? Yes, but so much needs to be done before we get there. If it's going to happen that there's going to be a fair election. It will be in the United States because of the decentralized federal structure that there is there and the democratic tradition that there is there too. I mean, what was it that Robert Barnes was talking about? You know, there's all very tough Scots-Irish tradition in places like Tennessee, where he comes from. And I think that is a real factor in American politics. And of course, if America turns, everything else turns too. Uh, Ronald B. says, how can you eliminate voter fraud in 2024? 
with great difficulty. Yeah. Uh, Can USA says, why do I see a world a year from now when the public in the West has moved on to the new crisis or fascination and they forget all about Ukraine? What I know for sure is the Russians will not forget, never. I absolutely correct. Excellent You're point. totally right. You're so, so right in what you just said. It's, you know, the, the, in the West, we have this... Um, this um, thing it's the romans the imperial roman style of governance bread well we don't provide much of that anymore we're, we're providing less of that but bread and spectacles hmm. peter h h kellen says does russia have the power to clean up the bio labs bio labs in kazakhstan do they have the power to throw chevron out what is the actual situation in kazakhstan and how is the country affected I'm sure they will, and I, I'm sure they do. It's the short answer. At this moment in time, uh, uh, um, I mean, you know, they don't want to throw out Chevron. Um, for one thing, what they want to do is they want to keep Kazakh oil still trading. Because from their point of view, Kazakh oil, by the way, is imported into the US. But I think they want to do that because, to be straightforward about it, it goes th through Russian pipes. It's impossible to tell the one from the other, Russian oil and Kazakh oil. And the administration has said, you know, that it's not going to interfere with oil from Kazakhstan. But eventually they will clean it up. I have no doubt about that. JJHW says that Robert is correct. The Russians will have war-gamed everything. I'm sure she's sure they will, yeah. Hmm. I'm sure he's right. And finally, Brian says... Uh, to Robert, but I'm going to throw it to you, Alexander. Do you know what's happening with the Chelsea Football Club and all of this? Oh yeah, stuff I, with yeah, I'm probably. What's, what's going to happen? A to better, them? I'm in a better position to answer that than Robert is because, of course, I live in Britain. But I'm going to sort of say that nobody really knows. I mean, it, it, it's up for a fire sale at the moment. But the big question is, can Abramovich actually sell? Given that you know it, he's sanctioned. So how, how exactly do you sell Chelsea Football Club when its owner might not be in a position to actually execute on a sale? So it's a very, very complex legal situation, which nobody has thought of. But, I mean, eventually, because it's Chelsea is one of the big football institutions in Britain. It's one of the big London clubs. I mean, Chelsea, Arsenal, uh, Tottenham Hotspur, these are the sort of big, big London clubs, they're not going to let it fail. Because if, of course, they do, I mean, you know, going to have a lot of very angry Chelsea supporters in London. So they'll find a way through. But, of course, any new owner won't put the money into Chelsea that um, Abramovich did. Because you, they, they won't be as interested in it. And coming back to what Alex... <laughs> yes, and coming back to what Alex was saying... What super rich person is going to trust their money in Britain buying a British asset anyway? Exactly. And not even super rich. I would say yeah. a lot of people that are just well off are going to start to reconsider yeah. their investments in, uh, in the yeah. London financial system. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. An hour and a half of questions and answers. Wow. Come wow. out of ground. A brilliant, so, brilliant questions. Thank you to everybody. Brilliant questions. Thank you to everyone who sent us these questions. And um, we'll leave it there. The Duran.locals.com. Go to the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Since we're talking about the city of London so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Take care.